The, the mystic poet William Blake once said that you could see the entire world in a grain of sand. And uh, our next speaker says you can see the entire world in an icicle. An icicle. Yes, uh, his name is Dr. Fries. I came across a reference to him. I found it irresistible. I'd like to invite him up here on stage. He's Stephen Morris and he's created the Atlas of Icicles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this, this is a fantastic meeting. We can have the old farmer's almanac followed by a physics talk. <laughs> uh, we're going we're gonna to pay attention to icicles. In fact, by the end of my little presentation here, you're going to know way more about icicles than you ever wanted to know, I think. And it's actually a great opportunity for me to reveal my own little obsession with icicles. I've been looking at icicles and taking photographs of them and studying them intensively for about 10 years. I know that sounds ridiculous. I've done a few other things during that time, but icicles are one of those things that you can look at for a long time. But first I have, yeah, I am in, in fact Dr. Freeze. <laughs> I'm not really Dr. Freeze. That name was given to me by the Globe and Mail reporter and it kind of stuck, and I don't actually like it very much. What I like is the icicle whisperer. <laughs> and here I am, and here I am, it's not working, guys. Here I am whispering to that icicle. <laughs> what would you say to an icicle? I don't know. The question I would really like to talk about is the one that's been obsessing me for all these years, is what tells an icicle what shape to be? How does an icicle know what shape to be? There's nothing outside the icicle that informs it that it should be long and pointy. It just decides to be long and pointy. But how does it decide? And that's a physics question. First, we need to know how ice forms. Ice forms from water when you remove a certain amount of heat or energy from the water. So if you take water at zero degrees and you remove a certain amount of heat called the latent heat, you get ice at zero degrees. OK, so the ice is going to form wherever the heat can get out. And the heat release is going to be controlled by where the water flows. It turns out that every icicle is covered by a thin layer of supercooled water, just a few hundred microns thick, very, very thin. And the heat that's coming out has to get through that water to get out. So that water flow controls where the heat is released, and hence where the ice will form. And the water flow, of course, is flowing over this complicated shape that's evolving. And so where the water flows is controlled by the shape, which depends on where the ice forms. So now you see we have a problem. <laughs> Normally in physics you have a cause and you have an effect. But here we have a cause and an effect which goes back to the cause again. So this is a kind of feedback loop. And it turns out that an icicle's form, its distinctive shape, and if I show you a picture of an icicle, you would immediately recognize it as an icicle, even if it was purple. It comes as an emergent property of a feedback loop between shape and flow. You cannot sort of jump into the loop anywhere and decide what's going to happen. You have to let the loop go round and round and round and let the shape emerge from that process. So that's what I call an emergent property. And what I study generally in other systems is the emergence and emergent properties. And they're very difficult physics problems and very interesting physics problems. In fact, it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that this feedback between sh shape and flow is one of nature's great organizing principles. If you sit on a beautiful mountaintop in British Columbia and look out, you see a glacier. How does the glacier know what shape to be? Well, it sits in the valley. Well, what decided the shape of the valley? Well, the glacier made the valley, right? So there's this feedback loop. And so we can't just step in and guess from first principles what shape the glacier is going to be. We have to follow the loop around and around and work it out from that. And that makes it a very interesting problem. Like emergence is a very, very deep and interesting idea. So the icicle is just a kind of toy, a thing we can look at emergence very closely at. We can look at emergence of the shape of an icicle because we see them every day. Everybody has seen an icicle. Either in Toronto, you saw so many icicles, you're sick of looking at icicles, right? So if you really want to understand icicles, you need a machine, okay? 
It's not that great to look at natural icicles. They only come up a few times a year. So we built a unique gadget called the icicle growing machine. And this is what it looks like. It's a box. It's about the size of a beer fridge. It's covered with a Pink Panther building foam from Canadian Tire. It's got an SLR camera pointed in it. And inside that box, we can control everything. We can control the water flow rate, the temperature, the humidity. We can change the composition of the water. We weigh the water that goes in. We weigh the water that goes out. The camera takes high resolution pictures of the icicle as it is forming. And it's all connected to a computer. Because, of course, if you really want to screw something up, you have to have a computer, right? So here's Dr. Freeze, evil Dr. Freeze in his lair. So now we have to do the laugh, right? <laughs> we learned how to do that yesterday. <laughs> those things you see in the foreground there, the, you know, the white things are the refrigerators, and those duct tape covered pipes are, connect, are, are carrying good old Canadian tire antifreeze into the, into the machine. And so we can, I'll show you what it looks like inside the machine now. Here's a kind of schematic of what it looks like inside the machine. We pump water in very slowly at a kind of drip drip rate and it lands on a dowel which has been sharpened. And that dowel is on something we call the rotisserie, which is actually made out of a Lazy Susan bearing, and it rotates once every four minutes. And the water drips onto that dowel, and, it, and the air in the box is maybe minus 10 to minus 15 degrees, and an icicle begins to form on that dowel that is rotating. And it, we actually, uh, and as the water drips off the end, it's caught by a funnel, and we, we weigh the water that comes out, we weigh the water that goes in. Now, you may say, well, why are we rotating the icicle? Well, the first reason is it was just too cool not to. I mean, <laughs> we had to do it. <laughs> I, I told the student, look, if nothing else works in this experiment, we'll have the first movies of a rotating icicle. Isn't that cool? <laughs> but the real reason for rotating it is the same as you rotate the meat in your barbecue. You want your icicle to be nice and well done on all sides, right? So we rotate it slowly. Now, it looks like it's ripping around in this movie, but keep in mind that every second of this movie is 10 minutes of real time. If you were to see this experiment running in real time, it would be really boring. You couldn't even see it rotate. Now, the other reason is that we can train a computer to measure the shape of the icicle by visualizing the two edges of it, and we know the position of the icicle exactly, so we can take eight pictures per rotation, one every 30 seconds, and we can extract the shape of the icicle. And I'll show you later, we can extract a, the complete three-dimensional shape of the icicle from that. Now, this icicle I've been showing you here is actually grown from distilled water. And you'll see it's a very beautiful, regular-looking sort of sword-shaped thing. But if you were to grow an icicle out of good old Toronto tap water, it looks something like this. Now, this is actually a slightly different view. What I'm doing now is I'm picking out every eighth picture and animating those. So this, pic this icicle is rotating, but you're seeing it from eight rotational points of view uh, eight times, OK? So it's, uh, it's actually rotating one eighth of a revolution per each uh, uh, piece of the movie. If you look closely at it, you'll, you'll notice that it has a, a texture. It has a ripply shape. And this was the first mystery, the first surprise. We discovered that icicles made from tap water, which is really close to being distilled in purity, uh, are actually different than icicles made from distilled water. In particular, tap water icicles have little ripples on them. And if you go out in nature and you look at icicles that are around on the side of your house, these are some of these are off my house, you'll notice that they quite often have this kind of undulatory, ripply shape. I like the one on the right there, which is actually quite a big diameter, and so you see the ripples very clearly. So what do we know about these icicle ripples? Well, they're sort of like the Michelin Man, you know, they're bulgy. The one first strange thing after the discovery that, they're, that they depend on the salting or impurities of the water, the next discovery is that ripples are always observed to have a wavelength that's extremely close to one centimeter in length. So if you count the bumps on the thing there and you, and you look at the, the stick next to it, you'll find that they're almost exactly one centimeter apart. So if you're ever out in the woods and you've lost your meter stick, you can just break off the nearest icicle and you know, it makes a pretty good meter stick. And then the, the weird thing was that ripples are not observed on distilled water icicles, but they are observed even with tiny levels of impurities like tap water. OK, so here's the crucial experiment. The icicle on the left is made from distilled water. The icicle in the middle is made from just enough added salt to distilled water to make water which is as impure as Toronto tap water. And the one on the right is a little bit more salty than that. 
we had to make scientific tap water. So we took distilled water and we added sodium chloride to it. And I said, well, if we're going to make impure water, we want the impurity to be as pure as possible. So we spent $300 on a bottle of Sigma Aldrich 99's pure sodium chloride. So that's like salt and nothing else, okay? So we put that in the distilled water, and we put just a tiny amount in, and that gives us the icicle in the center. And that has the ripples about as big as you see on tap water. And the one on the right is a little more ripply, quite a bit more ripply. So what we can do with the computer, we can take the picture of the icicle, and we can extract the edge uh, electronically, and we can spread that out in time. So this is kind of a topographic map which shows you how the ripples evolve in time. And so what you see is those little patches of stripes, those correspond to the ripples appearing, and the red color is about two millimeters higher than the surroundings, and the blue color is about two millimeters below. And so we can map in, in full detail the exact uh, motion of the ripples throughout the icicle's lifetime. Now we're gonna do a little sort of a citizen science project here. I'm gonna ask you to look at the icicle on the left, which has a low quantity of salt in it, and I want you to focus on the ripples uh, high up on the icicle as they form and tell me what you see. They're kind of small because this is a low level of salt. But what do you notice about them if you focus your eye on them very carefully? Do they move? Anybody care to shout out which direction that they move? Upward. Very good, you pass. <laughs> It turns out that the ripples on icicles made with small quantities of salt move upward. Now, you might say, how could a piece of ice move? Well, it doesn't move. What's happening is that the ripple, the ice is forming higher and higher on the existing ripple, and so it climbs upward very slowly. Now, let's look at the one on the right. It's got a lot more salt in it, so it's quite a lot more ripply. And what do you notice? The ripples go down on that one. So just to show you we can really measure this stuff, here's the data. And this is a function of concentration of salt. On the left, we have upward motion, so a positive velocity, and, and that's at a very, very tiny concentration of salt. And then there's a magic, just right Goldilocks concentration of salt of about 0.1 weight percent. And on the other side of that, the ripples move down. So the ripples sometimes go up, and they sometimes go down. And it depends on the quantity of salt that's in the water. That's a strange fact, I think you'll agree. So, what are the burning issues? <laughs> the burning questions in icicle physics are as follows. Why do we always get one centimeter ripples and nothing else? We've tried everything. We've changed the flow rate of the water, we've changed the air motion, we've changed the different impurities, we've tried the different temperatures, we've, we've basically turned every knob we got and we never seen a ripple that was anywhere significantly different than one centimeter. That's the first mystery. The second mystery is, why do I need impurities to get ripples at all? We don't know why. And the last one, of course, is why do the ripples sometimes go up and sometimes go down, depending on the level of this mysterious thing that we add to make the impurities. Now, the most interesting thing, perhaps, about these questions is that we do not know the answer to these questions at all. In fact, there is an elaborate theory. I have spent several of those years that I told you about formulating a full-on physics theory of icicle ripples, and I'm going to spare you hundreds of pages of equations by simply saying, it does not work. <laughs> we don't know the answer to these questions. Now, the situation is not hopeless. We have some ideas. But after several years of detailed calculation, we don't know. So this is kind of interesting. You probably heard that we're on the verge of a theory of everything, that the universe is you know, comprehensible, it's a giant computer, we're gonna run it on a, do a calculation and calculate the motion of the, well, I'd just like to know why the ripples go up sometimes <laughs> and down other times, you know? The irony is we know more about the mass of the Higgs boson than we know about the motion of ripples on your garden variety icicle. So after we had done this detailed study, we were left with a large amount of data. Every icicle takes many hours to grow. We take a picture every 30 seconds. We measure all the edges. We know all this other stuff. We have 230,000 pictures of icicles. This is 
100,000 more than anybody else has. <laughs> and we still don't understand it. So what should we do? Well, the answer I came up with was to give it away. Because maybe somebody else will figure it out. <laughs> so I created something called the Icicle Atlas. And I convinced the library at the University of Toronto to adopt this thing under a Creative Commons 4.0 license. That means that you, you, and you can download all of this data and do whatever you want with it. You can monetize it. <laughs> you can put it on Christmas cards. You can tattoo it, you know? All you have to do is say that you got that picture from the Icicle Atlas. That's all you have to do. And it's called the Icicle Atlas. It's easy to find. If you Google Icicle Atlas, you will find all the data. Every single icicle that we measured has a little home page like this one here. It tells you everything we know about that icicle, all the space-time pictures of the ripples, everything. Okay? And there are 230,000 pictures and over 400 movies. And here's a little thing I call, this is a small portion of what I call the Icicle Rogues Gallery. If you click on any of these uh, little images, it'll take you to everything you could possibly want to know about that icicle. So you can shop, you know, you can shop around. <laughs> Pick an icicle that you like. So one fun thing you can do is you can take, I told you that we visualize the edges of the icicle as it is slowly rotating. You can train the computer to take those edges and project them back into three dimensions and figure out the three-dimensional shape of the icicle. And you can even kind of zoom down the hole. <laughs> now, why do this? Well, again, because it's kind of cool. <laughs> so here is a, a three-dimensional icicle, which I have simply sent to a 3D printer. So think of it. This is an icicle which melted years ago. And it is uncannily reproduced in plastic today. <laughs> and it can be yours. And yours, all you have to do is download it and print it. It's yours. <laughs> you could make earrings out of it. <laughs> you can scratch your chest with it. What else can you do with it? I don't know. You're going to tell me what you can do with it. That's the point. The data is free. I want to find out the craziest thing you can do with it. OK, so this has been fun, but what did we really learn? <laughs> well, every physics experiment is a humbling experience, even when it works. So the first thing we learn is humility. <laughs> when you pay very close attention to something, like an icicle, you learn that you don't know everything. <laughs> In particular, we learned that even an icicle holds a huge depth of phenomena which we had no idea about. And it's, it's true that the harder you look at something, the more you find. And finally, that experiment, which means looking closely, is a much better teacher than theory. If you'd sat me down with just a theory of the icicles, I wouldn't have guessed any of that stuff. Right? It wouldn't have been possible to know any of these things. It's only by looking that we know. So I'd like to leave you with a little quote that I like by Henri Poincaré, a, a contemporary of Einstein whose physics credentials are absolutely impeccable. He says, the scientist does not study nature because it is useful. He studies it because he delights in it. And he delights in it because it is beautiful. And if nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing. And if nature were not worth knowing, life would not be worth living. That's my life. Thank you. I'm touched. I'm touched. I, I, I need it back. Oh. <laughs> it took five he, hours to make this. He, he needs it back. <laughs> Hold it up. Oh, look at it in the picture. Photograph that thing. This is my first. <laughs> How about like this? Oh. <laughs> that's good. You look like an Egyptian. That's right. <laughs> King Tut. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's awesome. I got weirdly interested in this, of course. <laughs> it's not weird. Uh, no, at about four this morning. And, and I want you to explain to me and to okay. the audience, why is it that typically icicles form only on the Earth? But we don't know that. Uh, <laughs> we haven't been enough places to know that. Uh, 
It's probably because the temperature of the Earth is the only one that's near freezing. So the Earth is the only place where you get liquid water, gaseous water, and solid water all more or less together. My money is on Titan, however, huh. because I think that we're going to find icicles made out of hydrocarbons on Titan. It has a water table, it has everything, it has lakes, it has rivers. I think it may have icicles too. We need to go look. And how come we only find them in northern cities? Because it's too warm in southern cities to grow <laughs> ice, man. <laughs> Actually, an icicle is a dying thing because uh, ice on your roof, icicle on your roof means you have bad insulation, typically. So the romantic icicles on the, on the little wooden cabin and all that just means that it has bad insulation, right? It, if you have a good, well-insulated roof, no icicles, because the water that makes the icicle is waste heat that is running through your roof. No, but in the southern hemisphere, down uh, there in Antarctica, are there not yeah, any icicles? I think there's some icicles, but there's a lot of ocean down there. So huh. I guess I've never seen an icicle, you know, from the antipodes that goes up. <laughs> there are stalactites and stalagmites. Stalactites and stalagmites, and, uh, yeah. But anyways, yeah. you can Thank see you. it's completely engrossing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Thank very you. much.